So, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We're glad to see you here at our event in support of Spike and Media, which is an independent media source for everyone interested in Russian performance art, activism, action art, for researchers, curators, everyone out there. So you can already see the link in the chat room. This is linked to the original source. This is our website. Another important thing is that our platform is an un like it's a non-profit organization. It was found a year ago in 2020 as a branch of a research laboratory that was also dedicated to action art. We now have a team of 10 people, among them researchers, curators, activists, artists, and we're all working voluntarily. But in order to keep the project running and to also create a website, we need a little bit of a support. We don't have any sponsors or grants. We're only surviving on the donations of our audience. So this is why I'm going to tell you that we have two pages for donations. We're going to send them in the chat room as well. One is on the platform of Tinkoff Bank and the other is a page on GoFundMe. Feel free to donate. I'm going to send you links too. We'll be very grateful if you'll be able to support us today or maybe any other time. Um, and we're going to discuss why we need the support as well, like today, closer to the end of the meeting. We have already um, held an online presentation of our project on the 20th of April. We have this video uploaded on Facebook page. You can check it out there. Um, during this presentation, we were already discussing our ideas, um, the aims that we have, like what is the target, what is the final goal, why do we need the platform at all, and what are we going to use your like finances for, like your your donations. I'm going to also send you the link to that video in the chat room, so if you feel interested, feel free to just watch it. Okay, so today we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Uh, it is original title is the tipping point of neoliberalism. Um, art, Activism and Identity Politics. Now I'm going to introduce the participants of today's open talk. Nina Felshin, an American researcher, activist and an editor of a famous anthology on activist art. But is it art? Um, the Spirit of Art as Activism. It was first published in 1995. Um, the other participant is Tatiana Volkov. She's a curator, activist and a researcher of Russian activist art and performance art. And I'm your translator. My name is Sasha Stadist. I'm an artist, a musician, and a co-founder of the first self-advocacy platform for people with mental disabilities called Psychoactive, and a co-founder of an actionist theater called Cargo 300. So during the discussion, feel free to ask your questions and send them in a chat room. We're going to discuss them later. We're going to have like the general part of the topic when we're going to be talking and listening to the participants of the discussion talking, and then we're going to discuss the questions and answer the questions, and I'm going to give the mic to Tanya. Tanya, uh, you know, thank you so much for your introduction. It's a happy moment for me. I'm so glad to see Nina today. We got acquainted so long ago in 2004 in New York. I was a curator at a residence, at a curator residence, and we got acquainted there. It was a lucky chance. When I was leaving back to Moscow, Nina gave me this book as a present. This is the book that we already touched upon. It was called, um, But Is It Art? We didn't have this term in Russia here. We didn't know what our activism was. And when activist art was starting to develop and to grow in Russia, I was already kind of familiar with what was going on and what to expect. And in 2009, I have created the first project related to this. We also used to call it like protest art. We had the gallery, which was called FAT or ZHIR in Russian. Uh, and we have created the first festival of activist art during within the framework of this festival. This is how we started actually working with this field. And then we brought Nina to Moscow in 2009 uh, and Andrew Biden, who is um, also an activist and a researcher. And he's also a writer. He has a book called Beautiful Trouble. It's dedicated to creative activism, as he, he labels it. And now, as I'm kind of going back to organizing activist festivals, but more like in the role of a researcher as a curator, I'm like working on a dissertation dedicated to activist art at the moment. I was very glad to get this opportunity to, you know, invite Nina to our current festival. It is really very important for me, and I'm very grateful that she agreed. And we haven't seen each other for such a long time, so it's also like it's a very, just a very touching moment for me. And the first question I would like to discuss 
is the question of terminology itself because spica the solder like we have already discussed and we've already touched upon this uh last week it is a horizontal organization um and we all call it like this is why because it's horizontal and we have so many different people there we all label things differently i label this activist art because this is something i picked up from nina and i have no hesitance that this is actually activist art but people in different fields of art and research use different labels to label the same things some people call it action art or actionism performance well i mean there's a number of terms that people use to describe these things and in her book in your book Nina also touches upon some other terms that other artists and researchers might use. Um, maybe there's something I forgot, but anyways, the first question is pretty simple. How did you come up with this term, activist art, art activism? Did you pick it up from someone? Did you invent it yourself? Did you have any questions asked from other people when you just started using this term? Did anyone tell you that there's no activist art at all, that this is like ridiculous because these two things are so far away? Um, how did you work with this term and how is it being developed right now? Is it li like, is it like a valid term right now? Is it being widely used? That's the first um, question, I guess. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me here. And um, I just to brief, just to briefly tell you, I um, at my career has been mainly as a curator of um, of art, of contemporary art. And I would say that from beginning in the 1980s, um, the focus of almost all my shows has, have been uh, political and social issues, but I would not have referred to those exhibitions as activist art per se. Um, you know, it's funny, I don't really know, um, I, I, I certainly didn't I just certainly didn't invent that, that term. Um, I have no idea I mean, it just seemed like the natural term to use, and I'm sure that it was already in use when I when I first used it. Um, I do think, I mean, I think there's a wide range of active of kinds of activist art, um, which is great. I mean, I don't think we have to pinpoint or narrow it down to one definition. Um, and I would say that um, my my book, but is it art? The spirit of art is activism is a very specific kind of activist art. And it may not apply to what you refer to as performative activism, but it does so what? <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, my, my book, um, there were certain criteria or certain things that as I explored what it was that got the book off the ground, there was um, a, um, there was a, a certain, it was usually community-based. It referred to issues in a particular community in, in the United States that could be, you know, very different communities. It could be a community in San Diego, California, where there are, you know, a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants. There's a lot of police violence, which there is all over this country. Um, or it could also, ref you know, a, a number of the practices, in fact, all of them except one deal with issues specifically about women, um, sexual harassment, violence against women, um, other kinds of issues that um, address feminist issues, essentially. Um, so I don't think um, there's, you know, there's a specific definition of activist art. I think it embraces a lot of a lot of different art. But I, I guess what I would say is it often happens or mostly happens outside traditional art institutions in public spaces or in community spaces, um, that sort of thing. Um, so I don't know if that if that helps at all. Um, I let's just see. Um, yeah, I mean, collaboration is another another aspect of it. it. It involves collaboration among artists who are doing the project. But here, um, or at least in, in terms of my book, it also involved collaboration with members of a community who in many, you know, for the most part are not artists, but they just, they are people who um, are in vulnerable communities or have been disempowered in some way. And it brings them into the conversation. It gives 
uh, in many cases gives a voice to those we would say don't have a voice. Um, and, you know, as I said, another, another element of it, and I guess I we probably should be looking at some of the images, um, is that in, in the book that, you know, my book from 1995, at that time, and I will come to this, there was no internet. So a big component of it were, was using public space, the same space that advertising used, or, um, events would take place that would attract the media. And in, in those days, the media were newspapers and television. And that would then, um, you know, would communicate the message to a much, much broader audience. Now there are many different ways to do it. Um, so I don't know, I, I, Tanya, do, should, we, um, should we look at some of these? I don't know whether how you want to do it. I wanted to, I did want to address um, the title that I gave this because, as I said, neo, you know, neoliberalism is um, something that in, in the United States has been a major um, shaper of our culture and society since the 19, really beginning in the 1970s. And I have these two, um, this is my, this is my um, indicator that we need to have an image online, <laughs> an image on the screen. Um, the flags, if you have it, candy, that would be great. For me, these two, um, the, the flag on the left um, was created by a group called Adbusters. And Adbusters um, are in Canada. And they're the same group that came up with the term Occupy Wall Street. Um, and here you see the American flag with all the stars being uh, logos of corporations. So that, um, that is a very important feature of our culture here right now. Um, corporations are, uh, the, essentially the government has been corporatized in a sense because um, corporations um, form big lobbying groups and contribute to all the political candidates, um, but it's also created, um, you know, there have been, there's been deregulation and privatization uh, in many industries. And the, the bottom line of all this, and I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing images of myself and Tanya and, and uh, Dasha on the side. So I don't know if you can read the uh, flag on the right, which is a, a, a work by Barbara Kruger. Um, that tells you a lot. Okay, you can see it. Great. Um, that really shows you the, um, you know, really talks about the inequity in this country, which has increased with neoliberalism, because what's happened since the 1970s is that there's been a bigger income gap in this country uh, than there ever has been before. And, and uh, the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer. And I think this has um, you know, it led to Occupy Wall Street, for, <coughs> for example. <coughs> and I think what became very clear <coughs> with the pandemic is it really kind of shined a light on these inequities. <coughs> I don't know how that worked in Russia, but um, <coughs> The, the lack of health care for vulnerable communities became very apparent. And again, even during the pandemic, the richest, the monopoly corporations got richer where small businesses had, were forced to go out of business. So I think, I mean, this may, I don't, the, why this is relevant to activist art is that a lot of the issues that activist artists deal with are about these inequities in our culture. Um, and I think um, that what's happened more recently, um, and by the way, I should also say that uh, this, um, the, the sort of the emergence of neoliberalism also coincided with what has been called by um, <clears throat> the scholar Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow. And the new Jim Crow followed um, the civil rights movement. Um, where there was greater incarceration, there was criminaliz criminalization of misdemeanors that individuals would not have gone to jail for in the past. And more often than not, the people who go to prison are 
poor people and black and brown people. And I should say that um, our new president, Joe Biden, was very much um, for these programs. So um, it, it, and it increased racism in this country. I mean, there is this myth that we're in a post-racial society, but that is strictly a myth. I do, we see that there was also an increase in police violence. I actually did an exhibition in 2000 called Black and Blue, examining police violence. And um, just to give you an idea of how certain things can be censored in this country, I did this at the university where I was curator and um, there was an attempt by the administration president of the university to run every single work in the exhibition by the, the police department to get their approval of the work in the exhibition. And luckily the, um, this was in Connecticut, the police department there said, don't, we don't need to see every work. But just the fact that um, there was this fear that they would disapprove and that that would be a problem tells you something about, um, you know, what, what it can be like here. I mean, I know, you know, this sort of thing, I, and I don't, I'm just telling you what we hear, that there's censorship in, you know, in Russia and China, wherever, but there is here too. It may, it's not, um, it's not necessarily um, uh, the government that does it, but it's, it's a form of self-censorship where, you know, an institution does it before the thing even gets out in the world. And, um, and even artists do it because they're afraid their work will not be accepted. So um, anyway, um, I should go, just to go back to the economy one, again, um, I think what's happened and this happened this past year with all the demonstrations following, um, following George Floyd's murder um, was that there was, it was very mixed racially and ethnically very mixed. And I think what, and this again is part of neoliberalism that even young whites who come from privileged homes are very uncertain about their futures because of the economy. And, um, and so I think that the, yes, the demonstrations were about George Floyd's murder, but they're also about the economic um, issues in general. And, you know, it was all, they were all combined. So it was a very, I think a very interesting moment. And I feel very strongly that the only way things will really change if there, if, is if there's solidarity among everyone, not, you know, not just one race or you know, ethnicity or gender, that sort of thing. We can go to the next image. Um, and this goes back, sorry, I'm kind of a little all over the map, but um, this goes back to the groups in my book um, where I said that um, they use techniques that advertise, the advertising industry do, did, does, um, but those took the form of posters, wheat pasted posters, um, billboards. So this is a group called Grand Jury, Grand Fury, and it was an um, AIDS awareness group, um, and they they came into being in the eighties, and this was. Um, a poster that appeared on buses all over the country during that time. Um, and they also, you know, it was also about government greed and not funding the AIDS crisis the way they could have and should have. Um, and here's another one. This is, um, this was in Soho, which is, was uh, an area that had, you know, a big concentration of art galleries. This is again, a grand, grand fury poster and it wasn't so you know you see here and it's interesting because this is also relevant to these times with the pandemic and um, that's why their their practice even though they don't exist anymore is still very relevant um, because it's not it's about not funding um, health care public health care that is because again as I said earlier there's been a lot of privatization and certainly the health care industry is highly pri privatized and favors the privileged, not not the vulnerable. I don't know. I mean, so I'm sure some of this will resonate with um, you guys in Russia as well. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, so 
as for the, um, I'm just going to go on now to what I consider to be the main changes in activist art today. I mean, now it's 25 years later. Um, I think for me, technology and the internet has, um, has really, really had the greatest impact on activist art. Um, and I would also say that, um, you know, the, the, it's used in very many different ways. I mean, it's used to the medium itself. I mean, there's, there can, activism can go on on the internet. Um, it also can be used to attract participants in an activity or in a um, cause on the internet. Um, it makes websites possible. Remember when my book came out in 1995, there weren't, I mean, we were using computers, but not to the extent, not and not for the same reasons that we are today. Um, <clears throat> so websites have been very important. And also, um, I think that social media, of course, counts too in this. But I think one thing that's been very important, this is a change from the use of billboards and wheat pasted posters, is that it can expand the audience in ways that could not have happened prior to the use of the internet. Um, so that if there's a, a one-time event that's time-based, um, you know, in the past, whoever was around would see it and there might've been some documentation, but now some of these events take place and there isn't necessarily a large audience, but um, what happens is that it's filmed it's videotaped and then it can go out to, I mean, it expands the audience very, very great, you know, um, enormously. Um, also, I think, and this, someone mentioned this word earlier, creative, I think creative activists. And I think that, oh, you mentioned it in relation to Andrew Boyd, um, that this is also given a platform to people who don't necessarily um, rep self-represent themselves as artists, but are very creative. And in my own work, in my own thinking, um, something has really changed a lot since, I think since 9-11 and, you know, seeing a lot of other various kinds of activity. Um, I think you don't have to be an artist to be creative and to do um, and to make art essentially. So I'm going to show you, I mean, in, in this case, I'm going to show you. So I also mentioned performative activism, which I think has been fascinating and some really wonderful things have come out of it. And there are good examples of, um, you know, events where they might in fact be seen by a few people in reality, but then films are made about them and um, there's a huge amount of, you know, the audience expands very, very widely. So I'm going to show you um, a few, a few um, very short, they're like snippets of longer films um, that I think have, are good examples of what I'm talking about. And the first one is um, by, um, Francis Elise, who is born in Belgium, but lives in Mexico. And a lot of his practice is, has to do with walking, but it's all very political, although he might say that it's neutral. Um, so one of, um, one of the really interesting pieces he did uh, that I think is one of the best ones is called the Green Line. And uh, just to give you an idea of how political it is, he had a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art back in um, 2011, maybe. And this piece was omitted from the exhibition, even though it's probably the best, well, the, the most well-known work he did. And it was, no one ever acknowledged this, but it seemed to be accepted. The fact seemed to be accepted that there were a number of, number of members of the Board of Trust, Trustees at MoMA who were very pro-Israel in their politics. And this piece is about the green line um, that was created, not a literal green line, it was a green line on a map but that was created in 1948 um, when uh, what the Israelis call the War of Independence but the Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe. 
So let's take a look at this, and um, and I'll you know then I'll talk, tell you a little bit more about it. It's just this is just a uh, you know less than two minute um, little video. It's it's actually the the length of it is seventeen minutes. And what he did was that initially he just did this walk, um, and then later he spoke to different people who provided a kind of um, text for it, a conversation that went along with it. This particular one, the um, the the um, voice, the voice is that of Moisha Diane, who was the um, defense, the minister of defense of Israel when um, the their war of independence took place in 1948. And it's his son speaking. So let's take a look at this. Uh, it doesn't matter, even if it's not exactly the line, this walk compared to the next walk, uh, the importance is uh, to make sure that it doesn't go inside the village. can go inside the home, mm -hmm. actually, especially built uh, since uh, 60. It's not uh, popular to the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What the fighter, I understand, mm -hmm. drew the land with quite thick pencil. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that created a series of like uh, unclarities yes, in the throwing was... itself of the... I mean, my question is like, do they knew at the It doesn't time? matter. It's, uh, it was uh, not to make a fine okay. line agreed on, because it was very clear to my father as well as others that uh, the borders cannot be decided by war. Uh -huh. uh, war can decide security, not even permanently. But security, at a given time, war can uh, offer a solution. But uh, uh, borders, and especially with uh, international legitimacy, mm -hmm. uh, cannot be decided by war. Right. So, um, I mean, one, one reason, I'm sorry, that was a, a really not a very good video, but if you, you could find it online if you wanted to watch the 17 minutes. Um, what's interesting about that is it was, he was, he was, um, he had a paint can in his hand with green paint in it. And he was he was walking through Jerusalem, the division between um, what is Israeli and what is Palestinian. And of course, if you're familiar with the wall that's been built by the Israelis, um, it has done very similar things where it has um, cut off Palestinians from their farms and from their communities and from their families. And so even though he claims that this is neutral, it really makes you think about the issues, um, you know, the issues that are in, involved with the Israeli, um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that's been going on forever, really. And the next, the next one um, is a really good example, is one of my favorite examples of a non-artist um, um, event that is, a, you know, kind of a performative event that is, I think is very, very creative. This young guy, Tom De Christopher, who's an environmentalist and now actually is at, or was, I think he's probably finished by now at the Harvard Divinity School, um, was very, heard about a sale of public land, land owned by the government in Utah. And um, this actually was illegal. Um, and had that public land been sold, it would have been used for drilling and other very, um, you know, other activities that were very detrimental to the environment. And so he did this, um, he went to the auction and purchased land, purchased land himself, although he didn't have the money, it was really more of a performative act. Um, and um, we'll see this, but I do want to say that Obama um, who was in office at the time when this got a lot of attention, Obama canceled the sale. And so I think it's a great example of an activist um, uh, doing something that actually had results. So let's take a look at this. Uh, 
I'm two and a quarter in the back and not a two and a half. Two and a half. Did you? Thank you. I have three and a half. Are you here for the auction? And I said, yes, I am. They said, are you here to be a bidder? And I said, well, yes, I am. $50 to number seven. Please, seven. An environmentalist threw a controversial oil and gas lease auction into turmoil today. Well, Tim DeChristopher says he's willing to go to jail, and it's possible that you find out that you are unconventional. Yes. This is the charges against me. United States of America versus Tim DeChristopher. Do you feel outnumbered? A little bit. <laughs> A million to one. When you take a courageous action that's based in heart and courage, as Tim did, you will have people stand with you, beside you, and, and follow you. Yeah. Yeah. This is not the first time we've had 10,000 people in one room reminding us that we are not alone. 12 citizens like you or I ought to be able to hear what the evidence is and then they make the decision as to whether or not he committed a violation of law or the government did at the time. Way. There's not going to be a road cut right through the middle of it. There's no way that I could ever regret what I did. Civil disobedience is forever linked not to living one principle, but being willing to suffer for those principles. So um, you see that what turned out, what started out as um, an act in a, um, you know, at a sale, an auction, became actually a feature film, which is pretty remarkable and got even more attention. Um, now, that's something that probably would not have happened when my book was being made. I mean, again, he had, he was working, it was his own project, but he had a huge amount of support from the community. And you know, it, it went viral essentially. So that's a, it's a great example and of, of someone who is not an artist, but um, came up with an incredibly creative um, act. And um, the, last, the last video I'm gonna show you, um, also I should say, and I hope I'm not offending anyone here um, because I do have a particular interest. I, I happen to be Jewish, though I'm not observant. Um, and I have a very strong interest in um, Israel-Palestine and um, I'm very opposed to the oppression that Palestinians have suffered. Um, uh, so, and my own activism, you know, there's been, I've been involved with a number of projects that have um, addressed these issues. So this last, um, this last video was actually the result of a flash mob in a um, the lobby of a theater in um, in Tel Aviv, where the play, uh, the opera actually, Porgy and Bess, which was written by um, George Gershwin, an American Jewish um, musician, and um, you know produced operas. Um, Porgy and Bess, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a story, uh, it, was, it was written and this opera originally was produced in 1935. So this was during the Jim Crow period and it takes place in the South. Um, and it's essentially, I mean, there's a real narrative and a story about it, 
but it is a lot about the lives of um, African Americans in the South. And some of the criticism has been that it suggests that all African Americans have this life. Well, we, we know, I mean, you could say that about almost anything and that was not really the point of it. And in fact, <clears throat> a lot of black um, theater people and even I think Duke Ellington thought this was an incredible opera. And so um, when the Cape Town Opera, Cape Town of course is in South Africa that had a long history of apartheid, came to Israel to um, perform this opera, a group of young people um, were very opposed to this because they felt that, first of all, um, they shouldn't be performing in Israel at all, but that there was a system of apartheid in place in, um, it, that Israel imposed on Palestine. And so um, the other thing I should mention is that George Gershwin actually felt that there were some relationships for him, he felt this way, between uh, the plight of Jews um, you know, during the Holocaust and um, African-Americans in the United States. And so there are a lot of layers to this that I think are quite interesting. And now we let's take a look. Oh, by the way, I should say that the performance is a song with different words, but it's a song the the um, is from Porgy and Bess, the music anyway, and they've changed the words. So let's take a look. <laughs> This is not um, coming across that well. Um, can I you know, clarify one thing? Yeah. Go ahead. So these people who were protesting, they were singing the song from the original opera. Why is it that they wanted to boycott the show specifically? Is it because the director and the major musician was an Israeli? Or is it because he was supporting certain policies? No. What it is, is there's, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, um, movement where because 
if an institution in Israel is getting government support, like which is very likely a cultural institution would, they are asking, and it's this is something that originated in Palestine, but there are a lot of Israelis who are supporting it. They don't, they're trying to, just as in South, South Africa, um, back in the 90, early 90s, 80s, there was a um, boycott of South African products and it really was very effective. I mean, it really mm -hmm. resulted in changes of policy and uh, getting rid of apartheid where so much economic pressure was put on the country that they had to respond politically. So they were say, they were trying to boycott this show, not specifically because of Porky and Bess or anything. Oh, no, no. It's because they didn't want the money to go to Israeli government yeah, and 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 I think the the greater significance here is that it was the Cape Town um, Cape Town Opera. So the idea was that they would empathize more because they had experienced apartheid mm -hmm. themselves. Can I, can I just uh, take a couple of seconds to translate sure. it for the people for them to understand clearly what is going on here? Okay. Yeah. We're ready. Thank you so much. Okay, and you know, if you have any questions about it, feel feel absolutely free. Um, I um, so I don't know whether we have any more time. I wanted to. Um, there are a couple of other issues, this identity politics, I wanted to get into, but I I don't know what the time situation is. Tanya, what? Да, да, конечно, нам нужно поговорить. Yeah, sure. We're we're just starting to talk. We have this topic for today, so. Um, I think you have um, explicitly answered and addressed the question, but I would like to clarify a couple of more things. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about identity politics, oh, when you're talking about nothing has changed since 1995 when your book was first published, uh, what exactly do you mean when you say that nothing really changed? You oh. mean that everything is going on in terms of oppression and in terms of like um, yes. the problems and issues that certain minority groups are facing? Yes, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think what um, what I would say to that is one of the things that I realized, um, and I you know I, I don't know if you um, I sent Tanya the, you know my book was supposed to be republished and um, I wrote a new introduction for the republication of it, and in it uh, one of the things I talk about where I do bring that up is that my own realization that all of these issues um, that are addressed in the book by in the different chapters are systemic issues. In other words, they are structural issues that relate to the system of government and how it operates in, in the US and um, you know the kind of divisions that I talked about at the very beginning. And unless these are addressed, and so these do go on, and that's what, you know, this continues to go on. Nothing has changed, um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats that are in office. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so, you know, poverty exists. Um, un mistreatment of undocumented immigrants, racism, police violence, uh, sexism, harassment of women, um, and in fact, during the pandemic, that became, um, you know, across the, across the world, really, uh, domestic violence and intimate partner violence has increased dramatically. So um, that's basically what I mean. So I, I'm more interested now in addressing systemic issues that, um, you know, that have to do with um, the structures of our systems. And I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, so with the third question that we're planning to discuss tomorrow kind of touches upon the identity politics that is originally supposed to help solve these problems, but I know that you don't find it helpful at all and you think that there is a little bit more of a complicated issue here than you can see on the surface at a first glance. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm not sure I understood. Yeah, so uh, now we're going to touch, I'm going to... We were talking about identity politics originally, and there's a notion that identity politics helps overcome and solve the problems of communities and marginalized groups. But I know that you do not really share this opinion, and you think it could be divisive, it could divide people, it could really prevent people from solidarization. 
uh, especially with certain minority groups. Um, and so, and I want to hear more of your opinion on this. Why do you believe that identity politics is not always helpful? And this is our third question. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I don't, identity politics in and of itself, I think is a really important, good thing. I think people, you know, it, within a particular group should um, know their histories, be proud of it. Um, stand up for themselves and their communities. I believe in all of that. I mean, I think that's, but I think what I'm talking about is that sometimes identity politics can be what I would call weaponized. And there are several different kinds of examples of that. One is um, how, the, how the government weaponizes identity politics. And a good example of that would be um, the appointment of a black man to be um, in, in the cabinet, Secretary of Defense, uh, General Austin. Now, on the surface of it, and a lot of people think, oh, that's great. There's a black man in a very high position. But you look at his record, and it does not. Um, and so that's how, you know, the, the fact that he's black is like the end of the story. But he worked for, he was a general in, in, the, um, in the army. Then he went to work for a weapons um, corporation, a weapons manufacturer, Raytheon. Raytheon builds bombs that the US uses in its various imperialist um, undertakings. And in the first uh, two, two months, since, since January 20th, when he was confirmed, he has um, allocated $2.36 billion to that very same company. So the fact that he's black doesn't mean that he's not pro-war and pro-imperialism. So that's one way it's used. And even um, Vice President Kamala Harris, who is black, partly black, partly South, South Asian, um, when she was the... Um, um, attorney general, I think, in California, she um, approved of many um, laws that had to do with incarcerating people of color. So again, I mean, you just have to be kind of aware of, of this, these kinds of layers. Um, but when it comes to I'll give you some examples in, in the art world. I mean, this is a personal example, actually. Um, I, I take it that you're all familiar with back in 1991, um, Rodney King, who's a black man who was driving a truck and was stopped by the police. And he ended up being severely beaten. He hadn't, I think he, out of fear, had gone through a red light. And um, he was, um, he was tried and the cops got off. They were not, they were not um, prosecuted. I mean, they were not convicted of anything. And riots broke out in LA that went on for what, many, many weeks. So an artist did a project called Disturbance, <clears throat> Disturbance Cycle, which was about how the media turned this event into a spec basically a spectacle. And he used it started out as a video installation. So it occupied a space, it occupied a room. Um, and he used, the only footage he used in the video was from the mainstream media and also clips from um, a video that was taken by a guy who lived nearby of the original beating. So um, in 2017 was the 25th anniversary of the verdict in the Rodney King case. And I, I knew the artist, um, Bob Paris, um, and I thought it was a really incredible piece. And we'd been in touch recently about some other stuff and he brought this up that it was the 25th anniversary. So I proposed to a um, art, online art publication, Hyperallergic, which does pretty, pretty good stuff most of the time, um, to launch the video, um, the internet version of the piece. It had not been launched. And I sent him some information about it. And he wrote back and he said, what a great idea. I love this idea. Then he dug a little further and discovered that the artist is white. And he said, no, we can't do it because the artist is white. 
So that to me is a really misuse of the notion of identity politics. The idea that, first of all, this is all existing footage. The artist, you know, he said, the artist didn't take this video. Well, that's, of course he didn't take it. I mean, this was back in 1991 and it was all existing footage. So that to me is, um, is a kind of a, a really negative use of identity politics. It's, it's sort of like the editor of the magazine is sort of suggesting we have to respect black people. They didn't, it, it wasn't a black person who took the, took the video. So that kind of thing happens a lot in the art world these days. Um, you know, it, it just, it's, it, to me, it, um, it's just not very thoughtful. You know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. And where the notion that only a person of a particular identity can <clears throat> express the suffering of that identity. Well, I think people who is, it's unfortunate because it's not just about being being black or brown or whatever you happen to be. It's also about sharing the ability to show compassion, um, show, sharing the ability to be em empathic. And I think for me, the problem with this, this particular form of identity politics, and again, it's very important to emphasize that, is that it prevents solidarity among people. It, um, it encourages and um, perpetuates these kinds of divisions. And I think, to be honest, I think that if, um, if people came together, it would be much more of a threat to, uh, to governments, you know, than if you can keep them apart. So that's, that's, my, that's my view of how identity politics can be used, not what it is to begin with. So that's, that would be my answer, I think. Uh, the other, if I may, i give you one more example. Um, there was a group that actually, it's amazing, it still exists called um, Tim Rollins and KOS, Kids of Survival. Tim um, was a teacher in the South Bronx, which is a community um, in the Bronx, one of the boroughs of New York City. Um, and uh, the kids in his class were mostly black and Latino, Latinx, um, and, um, and, and poor. And he was tasked with teaching them art and literature. And so he started a project where, and, it, and the amazing thing about it is this goes back to 1981, and this, this practice still exists, which I can't say is true for very many um, activist practices, where he was using Western literature, um, teaching, you know, kids were reading, and then they were, um, I think I have an image of one of the paintings here, um, where they would then apply images to the text of these, these books, um, which would be enlarged, of course. And so there was a lot of criticism that, first of all, he was a white man and he was teaching Western literature. Well, eventually it evolved into, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and black scholars. But the, the young guys who are now in their 40s and early 50s, um, they didn't have a problem with it. They were, they felt that they were being um, empowered to, that it was very empowering for them. And they were also able to find their own voice in this literature. In other words, they could figure out ways to interpret it that applied to them. And so, and they considered Tim Rollins a great mentor. He died just last year. So sometimes this outside criticism um, comes into play when it's it's not really appropriate. Um, and again, I just want to say this is this is I'm only speaking about a very particular form of identity politics that has been weaponized. Um, so I hope that I hope that's very clear because I do really believe that identity politics is very important. It's not the way it was originally defined. It was not defined as a way to separate people from each other. I think that, I think that, <laughs> I think that does it for my take on identity politics. Um, so do you want me to clarify anything else about that or? What kind of pictures were they placing on the texts? They were um, very abstract images actually. And in, in the case of, uh, well, actually 
we could take a look at that one image. It's image number 12. Um, in the case of um, George Orwell's Animal Farm, they were, um, okay, this is, this is them. Oh, might as well look at all three of them. This is them when they were kids, basically. And then the next image, um, and that's Tim Rollins, and you can see, and this is them today, essentially. So the fact that they stuck with this all these years, and actually, I think three, at least three of them are teachers now, and are, um, and they they said this this um, this involvement with Tim Rollins changed their lives completely. So I I think I think we just have to be careful about. Um, just assuming that something that it's a, I hate to use this expression, but a black and white issue. And here you can see one of the paintings. Now this, this may be a more recent one, but you can see they're very abstracted images. Um, or, you know, they're sort of figure, what I would call abstract representation, where there's some suggestion of um, an image or figure of some kind. Um, then there's another coming up, um, the next image, um, if you want to take a look. By the way, I mean, there's there, I just watched a three part, I think there's a fourth part um, webinar about kids of survival, because now they're just called kids of survival. That has been really fantastic. And I could send send you the link if that's, well, links to them if, if anyone's interested. <clears throat> okay, so this is um, the Scarlet Letter which uh, was, uh, you know, an early, I think it was probably late 19th century book um, about, part of it is about adultery in New England. Um, and these are all, all of the things that gets applied to the image, to the book are images by these young people and now these adults. They, they, it would have been, I should have really included a chapter about them in my original book. Um, as I said, it's really unusual for these activist groups, these art activist groups to survive um, as long as they have. You know, another thing, I just read an article the other day um, by a, a British writer that there's, um, there's opposition in the UK to Jane Austen's body of work because there's some, um, some connection. I don't know. They're 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 trying to figure out that there's some connection to slavery that's not good, and you know, and the idea is we should again. This is this is another subject: cancel culture, um, where you just instead of having a dialogue about something and being critical. I mean, there's no reason not to be critical. You um, disappear something, and I think for me that's a very um, very dangerous process because I think eventually that eliminates critical thinking. I think it's much, much more important to not destroy certain histories, but to critique them and analyze them and, and know that, um, you know, that certain things existed a long time ago and it's different now, but you just don't get rid of everything. You talk about it, you dialogue about it. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, some of these things lead to forms of censorship, you know, where, um, I mean, in this country right now, there's a, a writer, I mean, he's, he's long since gone, but um, who, who, uh, what's his name? Um, do doctors, uh, he did this whole series of books, Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, the most classical children's book writer for mm -hmm. a long time. And I mean, I've gone into bookstores in more recent times, you know, I've gotten presents for friends of mine and they'll say that's what the kid wants even. And this goes back, I think he was first started doing this stuff in the 30s or 40s. And, um, you know, and I, I remember I did a show about nuclear disarmament uh, back in the early 80s. And I remember in my introduction citing his um, citing one of his children's book, which was anti-nuclear, <laughs> anti-nuke. Um, but so the latest thing is that the Family Foundation, the, um, you know, he was a doctor actually, um, not just a, not, he didn't devote his whole career to children's books, um, that they want to take off the shelves and not republish a handful of his books because 
there's some reference to blackness or you know what they consider stereotyping and you know that may be true but they were written at a different time and isn't it much better to have discussions with your children about this stuff use it as a platform to develop critical thinking in children rather than just banish it um, so these kinds of things are happening all the time um, in the United States right now. And, you know, so for me, um, this, this is also, you know, it's an offshoot of the, the weaponized version of identity politics where, um, you know, that just is completely, um, you know, um, destructive. You know, for, in my opinion, I mean, again, I think the most important thing is to continue to have dialogues, be critical of this stuff, but to know that it took place at a different time in our history, and there's not a reason to destroy it. So I think um, I'd love to hear more questions if you have them. Uh, what? Yes. Oh. May I ask you a question? Sure. Nina, it's a very important like I think it's very important that you have discussed this because some people think that it's not going on in Russia but it is going on in Russia especially within the activist community this like hardcore intersectional approach with cancel culture and everything else and it's very important to open our eyes and all of these things and I want to say that I am as a person who reads a lot of like I mean I'm very much in the American informational flow because I'm a translator and I speak English a lot and I witnessed all of these cases with Dr. Seuss and everyone else. And I was thinking, like, you know, it's so strange. These are cartoon characters. They are animals a lot of the times, the, yeah. the main, main characters of their books. And I don't think that if I were to see a Siamese cat, I would have thought this is a Siamese person being mocked. Like, it's, right. it's so strange. Like, it's, it's unless you point it out and explain this to children, they won't even think about it. I know. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, it's it's almost, I mean, if it weren't so sad to me, it's almost absurdly laughable. But, you know, we have to take these things very seriously, you know, and um, and I think counter them in not a way that puts people down, but explaining why it's so important to not destroy our history, because history and revisiting it is the way we can make things better, really. Um, and I, I have a feeling, I mean, I just, I, I just have a feeling that there are a lot of parallels between our two countries um, that a lot of people in the U.S. don't know and probably a lot of people in Russia are not aware of. But I think even this kind of dialogue is really good to have. And I, I sure, I hope they'll, this will continue. It would, be, it would really be great. Um, anyway, I, I really appreciate being here. I hope I haven't offended anybody. <laughs> Да, Нина, спасибо. У меня тоже uh, было как раз когда ты. Нина, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, I remember when I came to New York for the first time in 2005. I was like so amazed at how familiar and how really resemblant our countries were. They had so many things to share, especially yeah. when we were discussing our childhood. And tonight, when you're when we were talking about how like people in Russia were afraid of atomic bombing from the U.S. and people in the U.S. were afraid of from of atomic bombing from the USSR, and it worked like mutually, and it's so strange how it was like a reciprocal process. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Any any other questions or comments? I mean, I'm totally open to criticism too, so don't hesitate. <laughs> okay. So can I ask the question? Of course. So. Um, First of all, I want to say that I have a lot of problems in general with leftist ideology, so it's kind of funny that I'm um, translating. Uh, initially, when I heard that I was going to translate the talk on identity politics, I was very hesitant because I was not sure if I will be able to like kind of tune in because I have so many questions to how identity politics is being implied right now. Uh, applied, and uh, I want to ask you, what do you think about like in terms of weaponizing? I feel like. Uh, media and governmental structures in the U.S. are very absorbed in uh, neoliberal and maybe even intersectional agenda sometimes, and they're using it and abusing it all the time. For example, the recent case of shooting in Atlanta, have you heard about it? I'm pretty sure you have heard about yes. it. Yes, yes. So, 
um, I have noticed that despite the fact that the perpetrator himself claimed that this was not a racial hate incident, that he was not killing these women because they were Asian. Instead, he was killing these women because he was like he had some kind of sexual addiction or anything. Well, so like to me, it sounds more like a case of misogyny than mm -hmm. a racial case. But if you look at media, especially at like pro-liberal media resources like The Guardian, The New York Times, they keep like perpetuating this idea that this was solely a racial incident. And it's very interesting how I have noticed that a lot of intersectional spokespeople, spokespersons, they did not, they were not really very interested in the fate of Asian communities prior to this incident, but now they're paying so much attention to Asian communities, talking about how there's Asian hate, Asian people are being killed, yet Asian people were being killed even prior to this case. And it was not like, a topic of discussion, not such a widespread topic of discussion, not such a popular topic of discussion. Do you feel like this can also be labeled as weaponization of the agenda? Because I um, feel like it's a blatant lie. Like, why are people, why do they keep calling it a racial incident when it's not? It's still a problem. It's still a bad thing. It's still terrible. Right. I think, I think, um, I hear what you're saying and um, the, you know, the pr one problem is that there have been, um, and I think, again, this is the fault of our government, U.S. government, um, China has been so demonized by, um, you know, both the Trump administration and, um, and certainly now Biden, the Biden administration, you know, calling the COVID virus the Kung, Kung flu or the China virus. And, um, so I think there have been, and, and in like in New York City, there have been lots of, b before this thing that happened in Atlanta, there have been lots of um, attacks on Asian people. And so I think there has been, as a result of the US demonizing China to the extent that it has, there's been an outbreak of, um, of you know, um, racism towards Asian Americans. And, um, you know, sadly, in this country, there are, I mean, this whole notion of the other, which, you know, you don't hear, I don't hear that expression used that much today, but there's, there's any opportunity to hate someone, <laughs> hate a group, because they think they, they've taken over your jobs, or you're this, or you're that, it seems to be an expression of hate, you know. Um, so I think, in this case, I don't, you know, I don't know what to say, whether it was, uh, I think you have to look at it um, in a broader context because, because there has been so much anti-Asian violence in, um, you know, in the last year or so. So it's hard not to think that that had something to do with it, but, you know, you have a point. Um, the guy was, you know, clearly disturbed, um, you know, to, to th think that violence or killing people are going to stop his addiction is, you know, it's very sad. <laughs> and it, you know what it points out? It points to the lack of mental health care in this country. Um, and how someone like that who had done, I think he, this was not the first time he had expressed this kind of rage, um, needs help. And I'm not feeling sorry for him by any means. I mean, I think it's horrible. And I, I remember how the the um, sheriff or the, the officer you know, kind of let him try to let him off the hook by saying he was, I mean, this is completely off the wall. He was having a hard day um, is completely ridiculous. But um, I, th where I would agree with you is that, uh, you know, is that the government and, um, and the media, they're not, again, they're not looking at the structural things that cause this kind of behavior in the United States. It's easier to, <coughs> to think they're good guys because they're they're um, you know they're against racism, which you know <coughs> they're they're if you look at policies rather than these responses to an incident, you have to wonder whether there's not still um, a fair amount of racism, you know, structural racism. We know that. I mean, that's what's been discussed during the last year. Um, so there is, I think, you know, I think it, I think all these things need 
to be discussed in broader contexts. That's, I think that would be what my answer is. I don't know if that's helpful. Anything else? Mm -hmm. You have mentioned that you uh, rewrote an introduction and you're planning to republish the book. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, when is going to happen? When is going to be published? When is going to be available for purchase? Well, unfortunately, the publishing, the public, the publisher pulled out, and um, the um, the 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 two women I was working with, the sort of coordinators. Um, I don't know what exactly what happened, but I am still trying. I actually tr have tried to get the new introduction published, and I'm still trying to get the book published. And um, I, you know, I don't, I can't tell you more than that. I, I'm, this is a very, very bad time for publishing in general. Um, I, one possibility is to self-publish it. Um, I, I would need help with that <clears throat> because, you know, this is sort of not my area of expertise at all. Um, and I'd like to get it out. I mean, the other possibility, if I, if I can get myself to do this, would be to do a second volume and talk about some of these more recent examples or groups that work on, you know, on, on, you know, performative activism and some of the things we were talking about today and just did a second volume. And then I think getting the first volume published would be, would be very, very easy. But of course that would take a lot of time. Um, if anyone, um, you know, if you, if you want to read the new introduction, I'm happy to share it with you. It, you know, it would, it's copyrighted to me and, um, but it would be, I'm, you know, that would be fine. So you could figure that out. And um, Tanya has, Tanya has it and has read it. Oh, well, thank you um, guys. It was very <laughs> nice to be acquainted to you, with you. I'm so, super sorry that you can't see my face, but my camera doesn't work. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Bye. No, 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 no. We're not. We're not finishing yet. Tanya oh, okay, wants good. to say. Tanya is speaking. She, she. She has an idea uh, mm -hmm. to publish your introduction on our new platform because they were talking about the website. They're going to run a website. They're creating it right now. So when they're getting finished, we can probably talk it over. Whether you would like to, you know, like um, post your new introduction to the book on the website of Spica. Mm -hmm. And now we're moving on to the finalization. Nina, thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. It was very inspiring. It was very interesting. And people are, you know, sending thanks to you in the chat room. They're saying that this was a very important topic and a very important discussion. And for me personally, Tanya says it was a very important thing too. Good. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Will I will I be able to access the chat room once I leave this or the chat room? The chat room. Oh, the chat room. No, I don't think so. It's Zoom. It, it, everything gets like annihilated. <laughs> oh, okay. Once you leave. The and is this is this being recorded or was it recorded? Yes, we're recording it and we're going to probably like edit it a little bit and then like upload. Okay, great. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Bye.